brilliant. <laughs> Hello. But I have nothing to do. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> And welcome to Double Decker Boss. This is a British history podcast inspired by the dollop where I read a crazy story from British history to my friend and co-host. Today I'm once again joined by Sophie. Hi. Hello. We've done this intro two times already. Um, <laughs> this is a professional podcast. I promise we won't do it again. Right. So, um, okay, so before this starts, uh, first of all, send me stories. I need story ideas. I have an email link. Please send me stories. If you have any funny, true stories you know from British history, please send them to me, uh, even if it's just the idea for them, the general gist, so I can look it up and make it into a script and read it out, because I need more story ideas. So please, please send me stories. Um, secondly... Uh, this particular story does have um, a sort of background topic um, that needs a trigger warning because the person who we're going to be talking about did go through a bit of abuse in their life um, and just heavy themes like that which some people might not like which is fair enough and if you don't I'd recommend not listening to this podcast because it is also funny but it does have some heavy themes. Um, right, so... Chavs is an extremely well-known British uh, culture term. Any British person, and most people at least in the English-speaking parts of the world, will know what chav means. For those who don't, the definition of a chav is described in, ironically, the least uh, chavy way humanly possible as, quote, antisocial, lower-class British youth often dressed in sportswear. The term chav has existed for generations in Britain. The earliest recorded use of the word was in the 1950 book A Dictionary of Slang and Unconventional English. It's said to date as far back as 1860 and comes from the Romani word chavi, meaning child. So chav means child, for anyone who didn't know. Um, up until the late 90s, um, to early 2000s, however, the word was just a slang term and was only added to the Oxford Dictionary in 2004 when it was also made Word of the Year. <laughs> the British tradition... <laughs> we read that bit in the bit we had to scrap, but it is so funny that the 2004 Word of the Year was chav. How sad is that? How sad that the fact that that was the Word of the Year... <laughs> What has the British language come to? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah, it is very just insane. So, the British tradition of self-deprecating humour has also helped spread the word chav and the stereotype, with comedians making chav characters in their shows. The most famous uh, comedians to do so being Catherine Tate's Lauren and Matt Lucas's Vicky Pollard. I always get those two confused because um, I've watched both. What, sorry? How are they so different? <laughs> They're making fun They're of fun each other, though, so I just get the names confused sometimes. One's a man. <laughs> One is a man. <laughs> I'm confused. One of them's a man, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so... Uh, chav culture is often synonymous with drinking, violence and crime. In fact, many people today believe the word is actually an acronym of council health and violent, although it isn't. However, um, many people now logically and rightfully argue that the word is actually an offensive slur towards the working class. In 2011, Owen Jones, who for those who don't know is a left-wing political activist in Britain, released a book entitled Chavs, The Demonization of the Working Class. In this book, he argues that the word chav is an attack on the poor and a word made to demonise lower classes, which makes a lot of sense and since the book's release, the movement has gained a lot of traction. Quote, it is Victorian ideas about language sort of revived along with Victorian ideas about social class. The chav stereotype fits into this long-standing, very old stereotype. Um, which, if you think about it, does make a lot of sense because the word comes from 1860. And, um, yeah, it, people when, when there's a rich person who's an alcoholic and violent and whatever, yes, people don't like them, but there isn't... They don't get labelled like poor people who have that do getting labelled as a chav, you know? Does that make sense? 
So it is sort of a uh, slur against poor people. Um, and one of the most um, telling signs of how true this is, um, is that any time they can do so, far-right tabloid newspapers such as The Sun, Daily Mail and Daily Star will jump on the chance to demonise people by calling them chavs. Um, in the most telling case of this is in a case where a teenage woman was barred from her own home under the terms of an antisocial behaviour order in 2005, some British far-right newspapers branded her as the real-life Vicky Pollard, <clears throat> with the Daily Star running headlines reading, Good riddance to chav scum, real-life Vicky Pollard evicted. <laughs> we will come back to this later in the story. So, yeah. Um, because newspapers are just lovely. They're just a lovely form of media. <laughs> you didn't laugh. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it's really bad. There was a real human person who had a real life and was called Scum in the newspaper. I think I'd be more upset than compared to Vicky Pollard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a very good comparison to have to your life. It'd make you think, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, as Owen Jones' book points out, it's used to d as a demonisation of the working class, especially young working class people, as if they constitute some sort of underclass distinct from the rest of the non-chavs, in quotation marks. Um, but this demonisation has worked due to the fact that most people use the word to mean someone who is violent anyway, and many people still see chavs as a British version of Hicks in America, almost. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, for me, I'd say it shouldn't, we shouldn't value it any differently than we would if a rich person was violent or an alcoholic or did crimes, obviously. But, um, the you can still, in a sort of self deprecating British humour way, use the whole thing of making fun of people for being for like chav stuff and everything, so long as. Um, the subject of the joke isn't that that person's poor, but that they're just, you know, stupid or insane or whatever, if that makes sense. <laughs> Does that make sense? I think you've got to be careful how you say it. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I should have wrote it down, I shouldn't have ad-libbed this, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Um... <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> uh... <laughs> Michael Carroll was born on the 29th of March, 1983, in Norfolk, England. He did not have a very lucky start in life, and things began to go downhill pretty quickly. He grew up on the rough side of town. Carroll's mother worked in a canning factory, and his father was a Royal Navy Air Force engineer, but when Carroll was just 18 months old, his father was jailed in a military prison for 11 years for stabbing a couple after getting into a fight at a dance. Um... So that's a great start. His dad's in prison for stabbing people and his mum, if you think about it, it's 1983 and she's working in a canning factory. So it's essentially a sweatshop. Um, so that's a that's a nice start to have in life. Um, they still tried to make the relationship work, but his parents separated when he was seven years old and his father died from a heart attack when Carol was ten. Um, so things are still going downhill. Um... <laughs> The, they always do. They yes, always they do. always do. So a, a parent has got is probably going to die at the start of one of these stories, because um, that's usually where the spiral starts. <laughs> um, oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, a quick thing to mention is this story is probably about the most recent to now story I do. If the main subject of the story is past 2010, I won't do a podcast about it because that's not really history yet. But this one is as close to the line as it gets. So this is very recent in terms of history. <laughs> it's barely history. But there you go. Um, it's in the past. It counts. Yeah. Um... <laughs> His mum then married several very violent men in the subsequent years of Carol's upbringing, which only made things worse. There are, um, are reports, and this is pretty disturbing, this is the bit that the trigger warning was for, um, that one of them would lock him in his room for hours after hitting him. 
Um, so that's not that's very bad. Um, he also suffered from very bad dyslexia and ADHD, um, which in his horrible upbringing was never accounted for. So by the time he finished secondary school, he was barely literate and couldn't read or write. <laughs> by the time oh, he finished love... secondary school. We love the British education system. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's always been amazing. So successful. <laughs> The only European, like Western European country where your children can leave high school, not high school, secondary school, not even knowing how to read or write. Great. Brilliant. Oh, God. Um, so uh, the reading and writing he had been taught had not even been from the schools he attended, but from Halsley Bay Prison for Young Offenders, which he was sent to when he was 13 for shoplifting. He learned how to read and write. He learned basic reading and writing in prison. He couldn't even learn it in school. The prison inmates knew how to teach him better than the British education system. I mean, they get prisons better than school. Just <laughs> proved it right. Oh, God. Go to prison, not school. When <laughs> When he got out of prison, he stopped living with his mother and moved in with his uncle, Stephen Moncaster. Um, things in his teen years followed a predictable pattern from this point. Violence, drugs and crime. He met a woman called Sandria um, Atkin and they began a relationship and she became pregnant with their daughter Brooke in early 2002. Then, seven months later, on Saturday, November 2nd, 2002, at the age of 19, Michael Carroll's life would change forever. Like many people... <laughs> it's not dramatic. <laughs> it, well, it's justifiably dramatic. Um... Like many people who have little to no money and no support from the horrible system we live under, one of the only ways Carol could see as a way out was the National Lottery. So in 2002, he decided to buy a ticket with his last four pounds. He'd never bought a ticket before, but he had nothing left to lose. When he got back home to his uncle's house, he asked him to check the lottery and they sat down together to watch the TV as the numbers were read out. The jackpot for that ticket was £9.7 million. Jesus. Carol had the winning ticket. I mean, Jesus Christ. What? Nine... What chances of that happening? <laughs> They're insanely <laughs> low chances, but he did it. He had the winning ticket. Brilliant. <laughs> Definitely not jealous. <laughs> <laughs> at the time he went to cash in his ticket he had a low paying part time job as a binman and he didn't have a bank account and was electronically tagged for stealing a car <laughs> and he's won 9.7 million pounds because that makes sense <laughs> in trouble and wins 9 million <laughs> yeah the BBC interviewed him and his uncle on the day he went to cash in his cheque he stated he would buy a car and a nice house by a lake so he could go fishing, but leave it at that. But his uncle stated he was kind of concerned about what he'd do with the money. <laughs> oh, wait, how old is he at this point? He's 19. Yeah, then he's definitely not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> he's 19, and bearing in mind as well, he is... I mean, I know we just talked about how it's sort of a low-class slur and everything, but bearing in mind he is the epitome of a stereotypical chav at this point as well. Um, right. So... And he's prone to fighting and clearly doesn't care about the law at yes. all. Yes, <laughs> and he's won £9 million. Pounds. And it's really weird because when I was researching this, the thing that was the most telling of how close to now this is, is there's so many quotes and I could actually watch the interviews and things. I went and watched the BBC interview where his uncle was like, yeah, I don't know, he's probably not gonna <laughs> spend the money very well. <laughs> um... <laughs> Carroll started off by giving one million pounds to his favourite football club, the Rangers. <laughs> He's definitely 19. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, he then gave another million to his uncle, which his uncle used to build a house, and then gave a million to his mum and his girlfriend's mum. <laughs> His girlfriend's mum must be like, oh my god, thank you. <laughs> Look, it's not even in her family, it's just her daughter's boyfriend just became a millionaire and just gave her a million pounds. He's a good guy, he's he's nice yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. Carol then also bought a six-bedroom home, the Grange, in Swatham, Norfolk, for um, £3,400 off of actress Anne Aubrey. Um, not £3,400, sorry. I read that completely wrong. That would be insanely cheap. Um, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, he bought it for £340,000, is what I meant to say. I don't know where £3,400 came from. Um <laughs> Yeah, off of actress Anne Aubrey, and then married Sandra in 2003. But things then started going downhill once again. Carol used... Brilliant. Yeah. Carol started using large parts of the rest of his money on drugs and would have lavish parties where he surrounded himself with prostitutes and he bought five Rot Rottweilers to guard his house. Jesus Christ. What is it with all these like rich people having little kids and then just going off and doing things like this? Yeah, I mean, it, it makes no sense. Yeah, um, and he he's got all these prostitutes and everything, but he's married to Sandra, and Sandra's pregnant with their daughter, even though he's doing this. Um, and then. Uh, he went on to spend another £400,000 on lavish upgrades to the home, including a swimming pool and jacuzzi, and he was an alcoholic. Quote, I'd wake up and drink half a bottle of vodka before I got out of bed. <laughs> That's a quote from him. I should do it in, like, a stereotypical child voice, but I won't. <laughs> No, don't. After all, was it your Scottish one? We're not, we're not going through that again. No. <laughs> all of this <laughs> Scottish Batman I'm never going to get over Scottish Batman um, <laughs> um, the, all of this led to his wife leaving him and taking Brooke within six months of the lottery win and took another million in the divorce settlement I would have taken way more than that <laughs> <laughs> it's still a million though it's still going to set you up for life um, yeah true <laughs> Carol had spent over 4 million pounds in 6 months oh my to have to have the ability to do that though not just to have the ability to do that but to go from having a part time job and having no money at all being down to your last four pounds and then six months later you've spent four million pounds did he invest money into anything so he'd make more or did he literally just spend it he just spent it i think the football club thing was an investment but then i came across the thing i didn't write it in here because it wasn't noteworthy enough but i came across the thing that said the football club um declared bankruptcy even though they got that money and just liquidated like i don't know a year or so later so he didn't see any return on that investment <laughs> what an idiot <laughs> what an idiot Now that Sandra and his daughter Brooke were gone, there was nothing stopping Carol from going fully insane. He held what he called Roman-style orgies and once boasted that he'd bedded 4,000 women because of them. Oh my god. Yeah. You would have low standards yeah. to do that. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't even know. Did I put? I did put it in here. I'll get to that. Um, this is the, probably the most horrific part of this whole thing. Um, he also started taking hard drugs on a massive scale. Quote: um, I was smoking, and the dealer brought me some stuff and said, "Try that." I tried it, and I was like, "Bring um, one thousand pounds worth round," and it went from there. Um, and then he says, "I started sniffing the world away. Money was no object at the time." <laughs> Jesus Christ. 
Carol, when, when you... What were you going to say? Sorry. No, it's okay. Go, um, go for it. When, when did you start to realise that you have, like, messed up so much? Like, the drugs and the women. How, <laughs> how can you go from nothing to everything so quick? Yeah. Um, the lottery, the lottery fucks people up in so many ways. It's insane. It really is. Um, it's just I'll get to that at the end of this story. But um, Carol then was spending upwards of fifty thousand pounds a day by the end of two thousand and three. Jesus Christ! Fifty thousand pounds a day. Um, How do you even do that? There, there's another quote, and this is actually the most horrific thing of the whole podcast um, that I was getting to. Um, I kind of don't even want to read this as a quote because it's so horrific. Um, but I will anyway. Uh, <laughs> quote. It's uh, horrible, but I'm going to read it. Yeah, quote. I could stay up for four or five days on coke. Every room in the house, people would be fucking. Women would just come up and offer me sex. The girls would have their gear off and they'd be serving cocaine on silver plates. That was the okay. life he was living. Yeah. Um, and uh, the it ends with him saying uh, he thinks the most women he's ever been with in one night is eight. And that's why they call him Master Mickey. Oh, that's disgusting. That is disgusting. <laughs> that's very disgusting. That's ruined my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thanks for that. Brilliant. I told you before this started. In fact, <laughs> this one was going to be bad. My little cousins, are, they're going to want to watch Mickey Mouse or something, and I'm just going to keep I have this story in my head. <laughs> oh god, I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> oh my god, I'm never gonna get that out of my head now either. Um, <laughs> it's your fault. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the parties got so bad. loud and went on for so long that the council even set up a hotline for neighbours to report disturbances directly about him. <laughs> How did he get away with it? Was it because of the money? Yeah. He wasn't even oh, sleeping. The first bit of that horrific quote I just read is that he'd stay up for four or five days doing that. He wasn't even sleeping. It was just his <laughs> life. Dead. Like he died and the drugs were keeping him alive. <laughs> <laughs> Might Some... as well be at that point. Um, things got even worse when Carol then bought three acres of land around his house and turned it into an all-day, all-night demolition derby. He would buy hundreds of used cars and just crash them into each other and leave the wrecks around the property. Jesus Christ. His garden's a demolition what? derby now and there's just broken cars and bits of broken car everywhere around his house. What a twat. <laughs> 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 he would also start massive bonfires in his garden using anything he could as burning material including a 50 foot mobile home <laughs> he burnt a 50 foot mobile home on a bonfire <laughs> oh my god what is it with rich people and burning things or people who because <laughs> I don't burning <laughs> Do it! Oh god, I didn't even know. Mm. He then bought two more houses and several luxury cars, and by 2005, he had spent eight million of the nine million pounds. And that's not a warning to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Also in 2005, Carol participated in a celebrity boxing match, which he seemed to be defeated by Mark Smith, formerly a star of the TV show Gladiators, under the name Rhino, but the fight was declared a draw by the judges, so he just randomly went off and did a boxing match as well. I really want Can you watch the boxing match? I think so. I didn't look for that, actually, but I think so. It should be on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> Oh, God. Um, 
So he then had another child with a woman he briefly dated. This child was called Faye, I believe. Um, no, they were kids. Yeah, he's having more. Um, <laughs> then in <laughs> June 2005, Carol was given an ASBO by the court after it was found that while drunk, he'd been catapulting steel balls from his lavish Mercedes van, which resulted in breaking 32 car and shop windows in Downham Market. Oh, my God. He was catapulting steel balls from the back of a Mercedes van at people's cars and shop windows while drunk. Why? Because he's completely there... lost his mind. <laughs> There are so many other mental things you could do, but you choose to do that. <laughs> you choose to... When the court case uh, was publicised, the media dubbed him the King of Chavs. <laughs> this story is about the King of Chavs. King of Chavs. What, what a title to have. <laughs> this began Carol's war with the media. Quote... The press branded me as a lagger lout before they'd even spoken to me, and I decided to play up to it. Um, Carol and the press would have many interesting encounters after this. Carol telling the press to fuck off and kicking and spitting on the news reporters, while the news reporters would su shout things such as, quote, here comes the knobhead, and mercilessly grill him about whether he'd spent all of his money yet. <laughs> It's like a playground. It's like children. That's what, that was my immediate thought. Because he's just like going... Every time he walks past the press, he's like kicking them and spitting on them and telling them to fuck off. And they're like, here comes the knobhead. Have you spent all your money yet? And it's like... <laughs> this was happening like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. This is what very recent. Drugs and slight weird fame does to you you turn yeah. into a little child yes Where? um they also started making fun of the weight he put on since becoming rich one news article claimed he was attracted to the smell of chip fat <laughs> <laughs> that was a sun article by the way i'm pretty sure because the sun um living up to what it always does as being the least credible media source in the world um <laughs> love the sun <laughs> oh my god um but the thing i was thinking here and i mentioned it in a little quotation in what i wrote is that he all of this started because he was going insane and you know he was smashing car windows with steel balls and stuff and the press absolutely hated him it began a bitter war with the press but this is one of the things i was thinking is one of the things about being branding people as a chav and that being worse than when in the culturally and in the public's mind than when a like stereotypical rich person is bad and does bad things and the prime example of this is i thought back to when prince philip crashed into that car that that pregnant lady was driving and i'm pretty sure she had a miscarriage and the media barely reported on it and nothing happened to prince philip whereas this guy didn't cause any unborn children to die but he's being branded as evil and the king of chavs and a knobhead by the media and it's like what the double standard you know i mean i thought she just broke her arm and they paid her off but unless he's done it multiple times i don't know he's done many things um, living zombie yes um so uh but carol however was making it easy for the press he'd been to court over 30 times since winning the lottery um for crimes such as driving around the norfolk countryside in luxury cars throwing big macs and nuggets at pedestrians <laughs> i mean <sighs> i want to see that i want to see that happen <laughs> it's just like in like a, a lamborghini and he drives up to someone and throws a big back at them and drives <laughs> off um and then threatening a neighbor with a gun a police raid on his house that found £1,500 worth of cocaine and stolen goods, and most famously, the time in a drug fuel madness, he assaulted two teenagers with a baseball bat at a Christian rock concert near his home. 
a Christian rock concert. Yeah, <laughs> and he went there and assaulted two people with a baseball bat. How's how did he not go to prison? I oh, I hate rich people. <laughs> I mean, I don't. But I hate. I, yeah, I, no, I hate that. rich people. I I, I hate, hate rich people. Rich people. Wait, I don't think being rich should be a thing. I think everyone if wealth was distributed evenly then everyone could be like what we think of as middle class and that would be fine and there wouldn't be such a thing as classes but there you go um <laughs> every time he appeared at court he was seen to have a bottle of alcohol and be decked out in the finest jewelry and bling often wearing up to um a hundred thousand pounds worth of gold jewelry on him while he was appearing at court um, Why do you imagine like Del Boy? Yes, I'm imagining <laughs> that as well. If he actually got like, rich, wasn't there an episode where he actually got rich? I think there uh, was. Yeah, there's yeah. quite a few. Yeah. Um, he would turn up in fancy cars most of the time, except for one time when he drove into court on a tractor to get around a drink driving charge that meant he wasn't allowed to drive a car. <laughs> He's like decked out in gold jewelry and like loads of bling, you know. He's like completely lost it, rich person out of his mind, and he's driving to court on a tractor. That is so petty. Yeah. It... <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. I want to do that. I mean, <laughs> okay, but I do kind of want to do that. <laughs> I want to do that. I don't want to go to court, but. I mean, that move, though. <laughs> Glamorous, riding in on a tractor to court. Yeah. <laughs> Did he win the case? I hope he won the case. I do. I, I hate him. I hope he won that case. Oh, my God. Um, also, at this point, the drugs were catching up with him. Quote, the drugs nearly killed me. I ended up in hospital numerous times. When I was smoking, I collapsed, had a fit and was spewing up blood. I did that about 10 or 15 times. I'd come round and think nothing happened because I couldn't remember, but I'd be like a cripple for the next two days because my muscles would seize up. Jesus Christ. This is How is he not he's dead? Living. And then after that, when his muscles stop seizing up, he drives a tractor to court wearing a hundred thousand pounds of gold on him. <laughs> oh my god. I'm pretty sure rich people are immune, they don't die. They live forever. <laughs> the Queen's seeming to. Uh <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> With the excessive amount of court cases and the ways he terrorised the public, people believe that Carol should be locked up. Um, <laughs> which, yeah. Um, and in February 2006, they got their wish. He was jailed for nine months for a fray. It was noted in the court while being sentenced that since 1997, Carol had 42 previous offences on record, which is bad enough as it is. But at least 30 of those were after he won the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. It's oh, insane. It is. Crazy rich people. It is. Um, quote, prison wasn't so bad. You get looked after in there if you've got money. <laughs> <laughs> That makes it even worse. That just proves how terrible things are. Yes, our society is horrible. Um, uh, once he was out of prison, um, uh, and he was once he was out of prison, he realised the money had almost dried up. One of his problems that um, over. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't know where I was then. One of his problems was over one of the three houses he owned. Kelly Muncaster, the then wife of Carol's uncle Stephen, who we mentioned before, um, had been given one of the houses by Carol so his ex-wife wouldn't get it in their divorce. But now she wouldn't give it back. Quote, It was only bought in her name just to keep it safe if my assets were seized. I only put it in her name so my ex-wife couldn't get it in the divorce. I don't know why she won't hand it over now because I... I also gave her a million. I'm going to take her to court. It's going to be a bit weird not being in the dock, though. <laughs> <laughs> he's saying it's going to be weird that he's the one prosecuting and not the one defending. 
freaks out and he asks if he can move. <laughs> I feel more comfortable over there. Yeah, I mean, he's been on the other side of it 42 times, so... Like home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um... He was also now saying that money is the root of all evil and that it brings out the worst in people. And he said that money destroyed half the people he loved and it's gone straight to their head. It brought out the worst in some people, especially his auntie Kelly. Um, he gave her so much help and now she's refusing to sort out the house. Um, I'm sorry, he's saying that it's ruined them. He's saying, <laughs> that he's saying that it's ruined everyone else. But himself. No, I don't think he's saying that. I just think he's not mentioning himself. But he says money is the root of all evil. So maybe he's slightly starting to realise that he's losing the plot. <laughs> I don't know. He definitely is. He just wants more money. <laughs> um... He then said uh, he started seeing his eldest daughter again, but it's hard seeing his youngest. Um, he said that his eldest daughter, Brooke, is nine, and she'll probably call him a dickhead when she's older. <laughs> he's just expecting he's going to be a shit dad. He's like, oh yeah, she'll just call me a dickhead when she's older. I mean, I hope she didn't. I hope she just doesn't even talk to him. Or he's dead. I mean... No, come on. <laughs> um, so, at the same time, though, with money dwindling fast, he needed to make more, so he hired a man to help him write an autobiography. He also started taking acting roles, which he would continue to do till 2010, and he allowed Channel 4 to make a documentary on him. <laughs> the Yeah, one of the acting roles he played himself, apparently, in um, like a fictionalised version of himself in a movie um, and I tried to look up the movie and one of the only things I could find about it was that um, the they had to edit it heavily after it was first shown because it was really controversial um, because some of the scenes were just completely insane I don't quite know what was going on, I didn't look into it very much but it was just a completely insane film that he was in playing himself <laughs> I mean, it would make sense. I wouldn't expect any less from him at this point. Yeah. Um, his autobiography is entitled Careful What You Wish For by Mikey Carroll. Um, and a quote on the cover of the book reads, I made 9.7 million in the lottery. Did it make me happy? Dot, dot, dot. Yes, it fucking did. <laughs> And the, the picture for the book is so tacky as well because it's got like really terribly put on lottery balls everywhere and a really bad font. It's hard to just like describe, but it's really tacky. <laughs> um, the book is on Amazon and has such glorious reviews as I thought I was buying the Mikey Carroll story ended up with a book about the Aberdeen Football Club. <laughs> and oh my goodness, I just looked up the book. <laughs> Have you seen the cover? Why does, like... Why does it look like something like a year seven would make for an art project, or I don't know? <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't expect him to be that bad. <laughs> Oh, it is really bad. It's really bad. Um, but he, he was good looking. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. <laughs> um, but yeah, the first review um, was, I thought I was buying the Mikey Carroll story, ended up with a book about the Aberdeen Football Club. Um, <laughs> the second review <laughs> is, bought it as a stocking filler. It's much as expected. Not much of a read, but as an Aberdeen supporter, it's worth a glance. <laughs> <laughs> and most people probably know who this guy is especially if you live near him like i do either you love him or you hate him personally i think fair play to the guy if i won 10 million in the lottery who's to say i wouldn't do the same as he did i mean i i have nothing against chavs but maybe it is a a, a chav thing to do <laughs> to do drugs to get the prostitutes to the to the cars. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't um, want to say anything. Yeah. I raised the point anyone. at the beginning about the very valid point that 
it can be easily used by Tories and rich people to demonise the poor. Um, but it's also, in British self-deprecating humour, I don't think it's wrong to say if the subject is that British people are insane, because we are. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I love that they're all just talking about how it's barely even an autobiography. It's just a book about the Aberdeen Football Club. That's brilliant. That makes it even better. <laughs> As for the documentary, it's a prime example of the still ongoing war between Carol and the media. It's currently up on YouTube in full, and the first segment just talks about how Carol ruined the house he bought. It opens up um, with pictures of the house before he owned it and says, and this bit is going to be interesting to set up, I have an audio clip of this um, that I can play. I'll just make sure it's loud enough. <coughs> right. Okay. So right now it's showing the picture of the house. A charming hacienda in a quiet English village. A proper person living in a proper house. Like this very proper person, actress Anne Aubrey, who was the original owner. Now it's showing what um, Mikey Carroll's done to it. <laughs> the music. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. <laughs> Can you say the smell is... Yes, the smell is unbelievable, is what he said. Great. Um, the presenter of the documentary goes on a tour of the house as it is at the time of the documentary in 2006 while cutting to Anne Albury reacting to the footage of what happened to her old house. <laughs> I don't... That just feels like such the most stab at um, Carol that they got the woman who lived there before just to look at what he's done to it and go, oh my God. Did she sell it to him? Yes. And it's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> as plainly attack ad esque as this is in the beginning, in fairness to the documentary, the house is a complete wreck. Dozens of wrecked cars litter the property. All the downstairs windows are boarded up. The back garden is a demolition derby track. Weeds and overgrown grass cover the property, along with tons of rubbish and beer bottles. The five Rottweilers are still at the home, but they're living in their own feces and nothing has ever been cleaned. Random piles and bits of wood and broken glass are everywhere. <laughs> Jeez. And then there's one other <coughs> clip. From this, if I can set it up again. <clears throat> I'm really worried for the guy. I think it's a reflection of the inside of his head. Oh, fuck me. The inside of his head must be genuinely fucked. <laughs> <laughs> the inside of his head must be genuinely fucked. I love that. That's brilliant. <laughs> Um, in some ways, it's just another trashy Channel 4 documentary, but it's actually better than that because it carries on, um, because as it carries on, which surprised me, it admits that the media has been blowing things up in his life to make them seem worse. Yes, it's bad and he is insane, but the documentary actually does a good job at pointing out how trashy the right-wing tabloid news is, as mentioned before, and, um made all of the details worse by inflating them because to the trashy right-wing media he is the king of chavs not a human being with flaws like everyone else which has been taken to the extreme because of his money um he to them he isn't mentally ill he's just a chav who does chavy things and this was having a very negative effect on carol's mental health only making things worse i'm Laurie, but the only reason that his mental health is bad is because he spent the money on drugs, so uh, <laughs> I don't know. The media I, isn't helping, though. Um, yeah, but it's started it, to be fair. Yeah. I mean, I, I slightly... All parties are bad. All parties are bad here, is what I'm saying. The media reporting on yeah. him is bad. He's bad. It's just a bad situation, because we live in a fucked up country. <laughs> 
Great. Um, the other thing about Carol's fame that was hurting his mental state was that everyone knew his full name, his address, and that he'd won £9.7 million. So the threats were constant. Um, because that's the biggest problem with the lottery, is in some countries, in some places, you don't have to reveal who you are when you win the lottery. Because if you do, then, like, insane criminals will just try and take your money. <laughs> And he did reveal who he was, and he was famous, and everyone knew him, so there were people going after him. Quote, Things went wrong straight away. I got my first death threat the day after I got my, my check, and I've had thousands ever since. One said they'd chop my daughter up and send her back to me piece by piece, and another was sending me pictures of my whole family and the details of where they lived. I was really worried about my family. I began sleeping with a shotgun and kept a blade in every room of my house. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Yeah. Um, this is such a fucked up story. Yeah. And it only gets more fucked up because things came to a head in 2011 when he tried to hang himself because the stress was too much. Um, but things then went from worse to terrible when one morning he found his five Rottweilers' throats had been slit and they were all dead, killed by blackmailers after his money. Uh, killed by blackmailers who were after his money. He then paid the last of his money, one hundred and thirty thousand pounds, to the blackmailers who threatened his family. They, he said, men came to him with shotguns and said, "You aren't so big now, are you, Mister Carroll?" And uh, he gave them the money and took off in his car and never went back to the house. Jesus so Christ. He was so scared about what happened, he gave the blackmailers the last of his money and he ran away from his house and he never went back to it. Um, he ended up homeless, camping in some woods in Scotland for three months, living out of a tent of twigs that he made for himself. So, <laughs> how did he? Oh my gosh! He's fallen to rock bottom now. He's living in a woods in Scotland, in literally I homeless. One extreme to the other so quickly is insane. Yeah. Um. It's what... just yeah, it really is. While he was there, he had a revelation about how his life had turned out and, um, quote-unquote, grew up. And then, with some help from some of his friends, he, in 2013, got a job at a biscuit factory. <laughs> so he's grown up and he's got a job at a biscuit factory now. Quote. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Quote, my only outgoings a week are £95 for rent and about 20 quid on food. I cycle everywhere now. I do up to 60 miles a week on my bike and I leave it at the bus stop to get the bus into Eaglin for work. Um, I've always respected the pound, but I treasure my weekly pay on Friday more than any lottery fortune. I'm just so happy to get a wage packet again. So... You know, his life's turning around a bit and he's actually happy and now he's not got the lottery money. Um, he spent the last decade going from job to job, occasionally being interviewed about his normal life um, he has now and the insane life he had back then. His most recent job was as a coal delivery man, which he now still does at the time of the release of this podcast. So he's a coal delivery man now. Um, <clears throat> the last quote from him is, I don't look back with any regrets, for sure. It was ten years of fun for a pound. You can't go wrong with that, but I wouldn't want to turn the clock back. I live a good, free lifestyle now, and I'm happier because I got my life back. So, yeah. That's Jesus how his story Christ. ends. You might think that's the wholesome end to this story, but there is one final fucked up note. In 2016, Brilliant. yeah... In 2016, Carol's uncle, Stephen Moncaster, was found dead in his home that he'd built using the million he was given, along with his new wife, Alison. He'd shot her with a shotgun during an unknown argument, then walked out into the garden and shot himself. Oh my god. Yeah. That what? blew my mind, because he's the uncle that was in it earlier, and I watched an interview with the uncle in, and then this... That's just 
Yeah. <laughs> and that's how Crazy. we learn this story. <laughs> but but yeah, the um the morals of this story is the lottery's completely fucked up, our society's completely fucked up. Chav is a bit of a slur if it's used by rich people to um make fun of the poor, but also it can be used in a self deprecating British humour way, um, which is more okay to do, um, in my opinion anyway. And um yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> the lottery's so fucked up as well. I love that you give me the really messed up stories. Yeah. That's, Brilliant. that's what we do here. <laughs> that was the story of the King of Chavs. Um, his full documentary, which is a trashy Channel 4 documentary where the title sequence is literally just somebody saying fuck, fuck, fuck on repeat. I wouldn't recommend watching it because it's a bit trashy, but if you're interested, then go and watch that because it's on YouTube. <laughs> Send me Brilliant. stories. Send me stories. 